Hi everyone, Karina here, Executive Director with Symphony Tacoma. It's October. Can you believe it that we made it to October 2020? And I think last time I checked, we were in Jumanji level eight or nine here in the state of Washington. But if you don't agree with that, or if you have other comments, please let us know that you're here. Please say hello in the chat and share this feed, press the like button. We're so glad that you decided to join us here on your Saturday night. Um, and today we have such a treat in store for you. Symphony Tacoma's community is really, really amazing. And we have so many people that we need to thank to make sure that all this programming that we have here for you is provided free of charge for the fall. So please help me thank our sponsors, MultiCare, Johnson Stone and Pagano, Tacoma Creates, Tacoma Arts Month, and M Agency. Now our partners M Agency have a very special message for you. They are partnering with Pierce County and a lot of people have questions right now about where you can get your flu shot. So up on the screen right now, there is a new website that they created called findyourfluShot.com. And if you have any questions about where to get that shot, and we all know that uh, we should be getting it this year, you can just go to that website. Now, Symphony Tacoma's community has grown so much in the past couple of months. And the point of our Facebook Lives is to make sure that all of our patrons get to know all the people that make up our community. And today we have a very special guest with us, Jeff Snyder. Jeff Snyder has been Symphony Tacoma's second trumpet for the past, I uh, can't even tell you how many years, but it's been since 1998. And in addition to that, he is quite the Renaissance person because not only does he play the trumpet, but he knows how to make them. So Jeff today has agreed to answer any and all of our questions. And of course, that we all know the dying question that I have in my heart is, is there such a thing as the perfect mouthpiece or has my husband really wasted the last 15 years or so of his life? So with that, I'm so excited. Jeff is here. Hello, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So Jeff, a lot of questions that we have. And of course, I'm not going to make you uh, answer that last one. And I'm pretty sure my husband's pretty mad that I said that. But uh, <laughs> let's start off with a lot of people have great stories about uh, why they pick their instruments. For in some cases, they saw Gil Shaham playing um, on Sesame Street. In other cases, mm -hmm. the only instrument at their school was the violin or something like that. So can you tell us why did you pick the trumpet? Yeah, well, uh, when I was 10 uh, in fifth grade, uh, all the local band directors uh, came around and played a little concert and uh, showed off all the instruments that you could choose from. And I went home that day and I said to my dad, Dad, I'm going to play the drums. And he said, yeah, the hell you are. Uh, yeah. So I said, OK, trumpet's good. So I, I played the trumpet. And, and all kidding aside, um, my parents have been really supportive of me. And my grandpa played the trumpet and my uncle played the trumpet. And then when I was 37 years old, my mother admitted to me that she played the trumpet. So. Wow. <laughs> That's quite the admission. <laughs> yeah. A little late. Well, great. So, so talk to me about what made you choose trumpet as a career? Well, I didn't actually, uh, I wanted to be a pharmacist. And so I went to college to study pharmacy. And so I went to Washington State and uh, I was taking pharmacy classes and chemistry classes and biology classes. And after they were over, I would walk up the hill to the music department and practice. And uh, so I didn't finish my pharmacy degree. I, I got a music degree. Wow. Wow. That's great. Yeah. And yeah. so talk to me about your daily practice routine. What is what is that like? Well, uh, you know, I have a family and um, I have a relatively small house, so it's somewhat difficult at times to practice. Uh, when the kids were small, I used to come in here to Monette at seven in the morning and practice. And then um, I, one of my jobs is to uh, break in pistons. And so I did a lot of uh, uh, chromatic scales and exercises on the Monette trumpets to break the pistons in before we uh, ship them out. And uh, you know, any, any chance I could get, uh, that's how my practice routine was. And how has, how has COVID impacted, uh, you know, your life basically? <clears throat> um, I know that Symphony Tacoma has gone virtual for at least this part of the year. What about uh, your other performances and what about your work at Monette? Yeah, well, um, first off here at Monette, we uh, stayed uh, open the entire time. 
uh, we do our social distancing and, and the way we're set up is, uh, is that way anyhow. And uh, trumpet players uh, continue to order mouthpieces and trumpets. Um, people are home and they don't have that many gigs now. And so they're practicing. So, they, so that's good. Uh, for me, I haven't had much to do at all. In fact, uh, I teach part-time at the local uh, college and uh, there was no students because everything's online. There were no students for me. Uh, and I've had almost no gigs. I, I have played a couple of outdoor church services. So that's been nice. And in fact, tomorrow I'm playing a recital uh, that I, uh, it's gonna be on YouTube at four o'clock tomorrow. Uh, so that's one thing I was had been doing. That's great. And is it a solo recital or are you playing with a group? Yeah, well, I'm playing at the solo recital with another trumpet player. So we're both going to play uh, two pieces uh, solo with organ and then two pieces, two or three pieces together. Yeah. Wow, that's that's great. Yeah. So we wanted to transition into uh, your work at Monet. So what what got you from playing the trumpet to actually making them? Where, where did that transition happen? Yeah, so uh, after I got out of college, one of my friends, uh, was working here at Monette, but in Chicago when the company was located there. And he knew that they were going to be moving to Portland. So he gave me a call and said, send in a resume, we're moving to Portland. So that's really what it was. I sent in a resume and they needed a couple of employees when they moved here in 1992. And that's when I started working. In fact, almost 28 years to the day, it's the 3rd of October. I started in the first week of October in uh, 1992. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And and prior to this, did you have experience making instruments or? None. None. In fact, um, m many of our employees have no experience at all. It's all on the job training. And I think Mr. Monette likes it that way. Mm -hmm. He wants to teach us the way he wants it done. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I actually started working in the office here. And then I uh, came out into the shop and, and learned how to cut tubing. I learned how to bend some parts, uh, simple stuff to start. And then for many years, uh, over 20 years, I worked in the shop building parts and doing various jobs. And uh, then a, a few years ago, one of our employees uh, left to take a band director position that was her dream. And they said, Jeff, could you come up and uh, cover for her for a while? And I've been doing that now for, for a few years. So I do a little bit of everything. That's great. Wow. Real, real jack of all trades. Well, before we um, talk about actually making the trumpet, uh, it was really important for us to show you playing. Uh, we have uh, two clips that are ready for you. One is you playing solo, um, and I think you're demonstrating on a Monet trumpet. And then mm -hmm. the other clip that we have um, is a trio performance. Um, so before we play that trio performance, can you just let us uh, uh, know a little bit about who the other, who the two special guests that you had playing with you were? Sure. Uh, so uh, playing first trumpet is uh, my teacher, who is, was the principal trumpet of the Boston Symphony. He's now retired. His name is Charles Schluter. And the other trumpet player is Dave Bomanti, who is the assistant principal trumpet of the Oregon Symphony here in Portland. Wow, wow. All right, so Susan, why don't you pull up uh, the first clip of Jeff playing solo, and then we'll, we will uh, get that trio ready to go, or we will start with that trio.
that amazing? So what we're going to go uh, and start talking about next is the actual um, process of making a trumpet. And what we have for you, I, I think Jeff has a couple of uh, just pieces of, of parts of a trumpet that he's going to bring up right now. So Jeff, why don't you just show us what the parts of a trumpet are? Because I think when most of us see it, you're just holding it up, you're playing. And I don't think most of us realize all the intricacies of, of all the parts that there really are. Sure. Uh, let me grab uh, one of my trumpets here. Um, yeah, okay. So, so actually, right now, what I have here is, uh, is not a trumpet. It's actually called a flumpet. It's an instrument that Mr. Monet invented. Uh, it was for the jazz legend Art Farmer. And uh, we call this a Rajah trumpet because the mouthpiece is built in to the trumpet. And it's threaded, so we can change mouthpieces if you wanted to, but when it's screwed in all the way, it is uh, like one piece. So the concept here is the trumpet player is the instrument and this is the amplifier. And there's only one thing before between the player and the audience. So, um, so that's the mouthpiece. Of course, there's the pistons right there and we have a boy <laughs> a tuning slide and you can see uh, the bell so those are the major parts of the trumpet and so the the pistons themselves can you remove them or are they kind of yeah. fixed sure the pistons can be removed just unscrew and there is one right here Oh, and okay. it looks like it has, there's a spring in the center, right? That's right. So there's a spring and, uh, and this uh, plastic piece uh, goes up and down and when the piston is depressed and then when it comes back up. So that's how the piston works. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So we have a, a couple of videos uh, that are coming up next. Uh, the first one yeah. is on uh, the mouthpiece. So before we show those uh, that video, do you want to explain a little bit about what a mouthpiece is uh, for those of you that don't play brass instruments? Um, why are there so many different types of them? And uh, mm -hmm. what makes uh, Monet's mouthpieces uh, so special? Sure. So uh, the trumpet mouthpiece is a personal preference, the size. Uh, people that play in orchestras generally play deeper cupped mouthpieces. They want a big, uh, clear sound. Uh, people that play um, high note trumpet generally want a shallower cupped mouthpiece so they can get up to the uh, high notes. Um, the Monat mouthpiece uh, is really the reason why Monat trumpets exist. And the story behind them is um, about over 40 years ago, Dave Monet was playing in a, in a dance band that toured around the Midwest, and he was playing high note trumpet. Uh, he was playing music by Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears and Tower of Power and groups like that. And he decided after playing and touring that this was way too hard. And he quit and decided to try to figure out how he could make the mouthpiece better. And he did with trial and error and and studying uh, acoustics and physics, he figured out that the mouthpiece that people were using, when they ascended to high notes, the, the pitch got flatter and flatter. So the player had to manipulate that. And so people like Charlie and Jay in the Symphony Tacoma are so good that they figured out over time how to overcome the, their mouthpiece and the pitch, and they play beautifully in tune and they have a great sound, And but they're working harder than they actually need to. And so Mr. Monet figured out how to make a mouthpiece where if you didn't, uh, if, you, if you keep your body neutral, the pitch is even throughout all octaves and all volumes as well. When you play loud, the pitch drops as well. So trumpet players have figured out how to overcome that. Trombone players and, and uh, tuba players too, it's the same phenomenon. So that's where uh, Monet mouthpieces came from. And then that led to the trumpets. And that's why we can make trumpets that are completely different than what everybody else is doing. 
So let's take a look at that process of uh, making a mouthpiece. I think we have a video uh, that is being loaded up and we can figure out how that mouthpiece works. Okay. So what is that machine? What machine is, is moving um, the mouthpiece back and forth? Hey Jeff, I think um I think we may have lost your your audio really quickly. If you wouldn't mind just making sure that you haven't muted yourself. I really want to know though what machine that is when you get back up. It's been a really great experience for us here at Symphony Tacoma, uh, learning how to navigate through all of these new technologies that we have and all these different platforms. So I think we're just going to give Jeff a moment to log back in while we <laughs> figure out. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, so Jeff, yeah. question we were we were dying to know what what machine yeah. is is moving everything back and forth, and, and what does that do, and how do sure. you get one? <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, we um, got this machine about 15 years ago. Before this machine each mouthpiece had its own tool and it was cut out by hand uh, on, a, on an old fashioned lathe. This machine is called a CNC uh, lathe. It is uh, computerized. And so oh. we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of programs in this machine that cuts different uh, shapes and sizes of mouthpiece. So in this case, we just saw a video um, of what we call the blank. It started out as a piece of brass rod and we feed it into the machine, and it, um, yeah. Here's here's an example of some some brass rod, right here. Just a simple wow. piece of brass rod. We feed that into the machine, and uh, hit the program, and it cuts out the shape that we want. And that was the video we just saw. I believe the next video we're going to see is the machine uh, cutting the rim and the cup out. So I just before we get to that video, what you're saying is the rim, the cup, even maybe the material that is used for the mouthpiece, they all make a difference? Uh, absolutely, yeah. If you're playing mm -hmm. on a deep cup mouthpiece, uh, you're generally going to have a bigger uh, sound uh, than when you're playing a shallower mouthpiece, uh, especially for people who play high notes. It's going to sound what we say we refer to as brighter more uh, high uh, frequencies in the, in the overtone series. Uh, that's what they would use when they're playing high notes. So yeah, they totally make a difference. So I think actually the next video that we have loaded is about uh, the pistons. So I'm wondering okay. if we might be able just to, to switch to that. I know we you brought one up uh, just a couple of minutes ago um, and we're talking mm -hmm. about the process of yeah. that. It looks really intricate. And then, so there's there's the, obviously the top part, there's a spring, but then there's a bunch of holes beneath it. Can you talk to us a little bit about what each of those holes do? Yeah, um, so uh, uh, the holes, uh, when you depress a piston, uh, it lowers the pitch of the of the trumpet, and so it the air has to pass through those holes and get sent out to the bell and out to the end of the horn, uh, and so that's really what they're for. Great. Uh, I have so an I, I have an example here actually of 
Uh, this is a piston with with just the holes cut out. As you can see, there are three pistons and all of the holes are cut in different places uh, so that the air passes through and gets to the right spot. Now, the second piston I have here is where we've put brass tubes inside of those holes. Let me get it in the middle and braze those in. Uh, eventually, we're going to hone those off of there and it will become the finished piston. Wow. Can you pull, the, pull that last one up again? Sure. That is a that is uh, interesting to look at. Yeah, so we we uh, have some pieces of brass tubing, and uh, we feed them into the hole, and then uh, we take a it's like a ball bearing on a stick, and it's spinning on a little bench motor, and we press it through there to get the 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 small brass tube to expand and fill into that hole, and then uh, and then it's brazed in, and that's what you see here. All right, well, I think we should take a look at that video and this is uh, how a piston is made. Okay. Hi, this is Dave Monad. I'm here at the shop working after hours tonight and we thought it would be fun to show you this little demonstration. Here is a, a Monel piston blank that we've uh, cut from a 14 foot length of tubing. And what I'm doing tonight uh, here on the CNC mill is turning the piston blank here on the left into this milled piston blank one step later on the right. I'm putting the piston blank in the collet of the fourth axis and it goes in and clicks. Then we're going to close the collet, like so. I'm going to turn the coolant off just for a minute, and then we'll cycle the machine here. There we go. And the next thing to happen is the helical interpolation. So the mill table is kind of doing the hula here. I think you can see. And the holes are going in. I can't run this very long without the coolant, so we're going to put the coolant back on, and we'll see this when the part's all done. Okay, and here's our mill piston blank in the fourth axis of the CNC mill, and it looks great. These little chips and burns from the milling, but it really looks stunning. The holes are just beautifully, perfectly round with a helical interpolation. It's just beautiful. And the location of the holes is within a ten thousandth of an inch or two of right where it needs to be for everything to line up beautifully. So here's the top of the piston. I believe John is running some of those two at the same time. And the piston tops are a fun little part, all done on the CNC lathe. And you can see there's a beautiful groove cut in the top of the piston for the spring cage to fit into. And over here on the other lathe, the smaller CNC lathe, I'm making spring cages. These are initially turned and then uh, taken over on the mill for the milling, for the uh, material to be removed for the uh, valve guide to go in there. Here's the number one spring cage. And you can see the bottom of the spring cage is also beautifully turned down and fits into that slot that we just saw in the top of the piston. And here's a set of pistons that will go in either a, a Raja P2 or a Raja P3. These have been turned down. The ports have not been dressed and deburred. But you can see that the tops of the pistons have been brazed in. And no bottoms in the pistons yet. That's a separate part that we uh, stamp and uh, turn and stamp and install. And here's a completed piston I just pulled out of a brand new Raja Extra Large Bore XLT STC that we're about to send out. And you can see the piston just looks stunning. It looks absolutely beautiful. Again, the ports are just beautifully round. Everything is impeccable. The brazing is just lovely. It really looks pretty. I mean, if you're into looking at horn parts, this is a cool looking piston.
So we have a uh, couple of more parts to get through. And then I know that there are many questions that we have um, up in the chat, but I think we we lost Jeff just for a second. So while he comes back on, <laughs> um, okay, now Jeff is back. There we go. So yeah. Jeff, we, um, we wanted to touch on uh, three other uh, short videos that we have, um, and then maybe you can explain the process of just kind of putting everything together. But we have, uh, what is a valve crook? Uh, the valve crook. So we have uh, three slides for each of the pistons uh, and each of those uh, has a return bend u-shaped crook as we call it that attaches to the valve uh, to the appropriate length so we can lower the pitch to to the uh, to the right pitch so does that mean when you're playing in an orchestra if you hit an e or something and you need it to be a little bit lower you actually physically pull it out is that what you mean so yeah it, it, yes um the the piss the uh the crooks and the slides are the correct length to make the notes play in tune but because of uh nature uh everything isn't perfectly in tune so we do move the slides manually to uh to get things to play in tune Great, great. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the next video that we have um, coming up is the uh, is that uh, valve crook video um, that we have. But I do just want everyone to notice that that last piston video uh, was interesting enough that it woke my cat up. Um, so I'm <laughs> curious to see if she falls asleep during this one or if she stays awake. <laughs> Hey, Joel. Hey. Hey, we've got Raz here from Toronto. Hey. Hey, Raz. Hey. hey. It's great to have you here. Yay, thank you. We thought hey. we're giving a shop tour, so we thought we would show you how a half-tone crook is formed from a straight brass tube. Very good. And thank Joel you. does that. Joel, take it away. Show us what's up. Here's the tube. That's a straight tube. You put it on a mandrel. You clamp it in place. And we just do this by hand, and then a ball comes in that's an articulated ball on another mandrel. And then we do this by hand. We don't do it under air pressure. And you just come around and make the part just like that. Okay? Oh, cool. Is that Yeah. Yeah. Once you got the setup for this, it's pretty easy to do. So there is a rough bent half tone crook. And then let's go over to the split guys and see how you finish the part. Okay. All right, Joel, show us what you got over here. All right, so what we have here are, uh, it's called a split die, uh -huh. and they're CNC made. And the tracks are made by CNC to the exact accuracy of the shape and the bore size of the parts that we're making for it. Uh huh. So this part here that I've just bent. Yep. As you can see, it fits in, into the track. Okay, can you close that up for us so we can see? So the two parts of the split die are mirror images. That goes in like so. The part is undersized right now. And then you'll force a tungsten carbide ball bearing through that part that expands the part just to the uh, inside diameter of the split die channel without crunching it too much or compressing the metal or changing the thickness. Right. Is that it? That's it. Yeah. So this is a finished version of a slide crook. Uh-huh. And it's been balled out to the exact bore size that we want. Looks beautiful. Wow. Really nice. And what we want to do is we want to uh, minimize the amount of stretching of the metal on the outside of the crook to keep the consistency of thickness around the circumference of the part as consistent as possible. Exactly. Yes. Which is your magic in how you anneal the part and how you set up the bending jig for it all to come together. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. It looks good, Joel. Well, I think unfortunately uh, we have Lola back asleep. So sorry about that, Jeff. It just was not interesting <laughs> enough for her, but though it was interesting enough for me. Um, while I think Jeff is a uh, Recoming on, uh, we just have a couple of questions uh, that I see are coming in through the chat. And don't worry, we will get to um, all of your burning questions. Uh, we just have two more videos to show. And I think this the, the next two videos that we have might be the most, um, I don't want to say the most interesting, but uh, it's, uh, oh, okay. Hi, Jeff, you back? <laughs> I'm back. 
<laughs> I don't know where I keep going, but I keep coming back. So. Well, you missed my joke about my cat being asleep, so she didn't find that very interesting. Uh, but we are, okay. I, I am curious, uh, the next couple of sections that we have coming up are about the bell, and then lastly about uh, the, the gold plating. So the bell, when you look at a trumpet, that's that's what everyone sees, everyone knows the bell. So my question to you, are they all, is every trumpet the same size? Um, does the plating matter on the bell? Can you have a bell that's plated in one thing and then the rest of the trumpet plated in something else? How does that work? Well, I suppose you could uh, have it plated uh, differently, but we don't do that. We plate most of our trumpets in gold. Uh, some of our trumpets we do uh, silver plate, uh, but it's all or, or nothing. Great. Okay, so Susan has, uh, I think, the the bell uh, video. Um, do you, I, I know yesterday you showed me a really interesting uh, piece that you had. It was it was just a flat piece that uh, the bell ends up spinning from. So I was wondering if you could show everyone yeah. that. So this is how the bell is uh, first created. Yeah. I think. Right. So uh, the bell does start as a flat sheet of brass, and uh, we cut it out into this shape. This is going to be uh, what we call the bell stem, the long part. And it is folded around a mandrel until it's in a, in kind of a cone shape, which is right here. So we fold it around and then uh, there's a seam. We hammered the seam down so it's really uh, tight. And then we put powderized brass in that seam and uh, we braise it. And uh, so you can, hopefully you can see right there that there's a seam. Uh, we like to make our bells in two pieces um some companies make it in one piece uh with two pieces we can control the thickness uh overall and uh, we think that that uh, makes the trumpet play better when it's that way but this is the bell flare the end so it starts out as a disc and we cut this hole in the middle here and put it on a mandrel and it's spun on a lathe and pressed down and so it looks a little bit like a sombrero but wow. And we cut out that hole there and then connect it to the uh, to the long part, the stem. And let me get that here. And now we've braised this the uh, here on this seam right here. So this is the second piece. And this will be spun on a lathe finally. And uh, a wire will go in here and that will be flattened around. And we have a finished bell right here. And it's probably hard to see, but there, yeah, I can't even see it. The seam, we have the seam going down the long way and then the seam, the other seam right here. And so that's a finished bell that will be bent and um, uh, attached to the trumpet. And then Jeff, what's the, the process after that in, in terms of uh, plating? And then uh, Susan will show the next two videos that we have. So, so how is it plated after that? Yeah, so we uh, clean up the horn, and that's one of the things I uh, continue to do. Uh, I help clean it up and get it ready for gold plating. Uh, we do uh, two types of finishes. When we do silver plating, we polish the brass. When you polish brass, it kind of hardens the metal, and that's not optimum in our opinion. So uh, when we gold plate, we give it a matte finish. We also think a matte finish is very attractive and looks good. Uh, but... Um, so we have a, a buffing wheel and it, it's kind of like the, uh, the Scotch-Brite pad that you, uh, that you use to, to uh, scour your dishes, but it's on a wheel. And we uh, scratch the, uh, the, the metal all the way around in a nice pattern. And, um, and uh, then it is uh, gold plated over that. And it gives it that really good look. And when you, when you uh, do it that way, you're not hardening the metal. You're just removing a, a very light layer uh, of brass, and so we believe that it plays better. Here's a gold-plated uh, instrument, as you can see, and maybe you can see that it's uh, a matte finish, brushed rather than uh, uh, a polished, smooth finish. All right. Well, let's uh, show those last two videos, and then I know that we have uh, quite a few questions, and we want to make sure to get to all of them. So uh, we'll just pull up those videos, and then we'll uh, go on to Q and A. Okay. I'll try to. Hey, Emery. Hey. 
We got Preston here, he's playing, and you're oh, making yeah. bells. What are you making? Oh, working on a flugelhorn and a uh, something. Uh huh. Okay, yeah. yeah, so two really cool horns. Yeah. Let's see, so this is the flumpet bell stem that you're working on. Yep. And then this is Jeff, the singing plumber's flugelhorn bell stem. And that's looking real pretty. The seam on that's looking great. That looks good. Yeah, it looks yeah. beautiful. Great. Thank you, Emery. Good yeah, job. Thanks. Hey, Emery. Hey, Dave. So you're working on this flugelhorn bell. It's a couple hours later. Yep. We've had two different players in playing today. Yep. We've had Preston and then we've had Jeff work in. And the whole time you're sitting back here working on uh, another Jeff's flugelhorn yep. bell. Yep. Jeff the singing plumber. How's the bell coming? Oh, it's coming great. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so here's the stem that we saw before when you were brazing it. And it looks good. So you're just working on cleaning up the long seam. Yep. Now the stem here. Boy, it really looks pretty. It's really nice. And then the flare. Here's the flare that's going to go on the bell. And then this is this is pretty darn big. So this is going to make a 7 inch uh, uh, diameter, finished diameter flugelhorn bell. Yep. Which is huge. Yeah, it is. It is. And they sound big and gorgeous. Oh, they sound amazing. And we had Preston play just a little bit. He did a little Benny Goldson thing earlier today. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, it was beautiful. All right. I look forward to getting this done, and then we'll shoot a little video when the bell's all done. Great. Thank you, Emery. Yeah, thank you. Emery, what are you working on here I'm now? Working on a flugelhorn. All right. Still, so this is the same bell we shot this several days ago when yep. you were just working on a stem. Yep. And, uh, and we showed folks what was up. So here we go. So this is a seven inch diameter Monette flugelhorn bell. And it really looks just gorgeous, I think. Of course, I'm highly prejudiced, but I think it looks just beautiful. So what is left on this bell, Emily? What do you have oh. left to do before we can bend it and yeah. get it ready to go on an instrument? Yeah, all that's left is I have to take the, the tool and actually flip over the bead and just get it so I can get it right on diameter. Uh huh. Okay. All right. So the the bell uh, the bell bead is not down all the way yet. Nope. It's really close. So you'll finish that up. Get a nice radius on this. Yeah. And then we're about done. Yeah. Then clean it up a little bit, and it'll be perfect. All right. And then <laughs> this is Jeff, the singing plumber's huh? flugelhorn. Yeah. Which we're very excited about. Oh, we love we yeah. love Jeff. He's a great guy. He's a great guy, yeah. and he's a really good singer as well as a trumpet player. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Emery. Yeah, of course. All right, here I am at our electroplaters, and there's the horn. The inlay of a thumb ring and the finger ring is not done yet. The inlay channels you can see are empty. I'll do the inlay after plating, which presents its own set of problems. Mark, how's it going? Not bad. Not bad. So you said the silver tank's just screaming right now. Right? Screaming, screaming bright. Uh -huh. Okay. Woo! Right, so. It's throwing really good down in here. See that? Down there, it's really bright the way down in there. Uh huh. Like a little gold thread. It looks really good silver. Uh huh. Alright. Great work. Mouthpiece nice and bright. Uh huh. How turn out, Mark? Really, really good. Really good? We'll try the plate. God, the art, the artwork on this is just insane, dude. This goes way past the collision horn. Way past. To the outer bell. Woo! Doggy.
and woo! <laughs> <laughs> Mark, thank you. Great job. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't that trumpet just stunning? So, so Jeff, the, the last one that was shown on the screen, is that yeah. playable? Yeah, absolutely, it is. It's uh, we call our decorated uh, Nervakalpa Raja Samadhi trumpet. That is a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it is a presentation where we've made a, a, a half dozen or more of these instruments for certain clients. That one was for the principal trumpet of the Boston Symphony. Uh, we've made for Winton Marsalis. Um, and the one you're going to see uh, a little bit later, it was made for uh, a man who owns a jazz club called the Blue Llama in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he got wow. that to be kind of the centerpiece of his jazz club. And he also owns a trumpet that Miles Davis played. We did not build that, but uh, he, that's what he has on display at his jazz club in Ann Arbor. I mean, that that's really incredible. And, you know, something that I noticed um, from the conversations that we've had about Monet um, and just watching other uh, instrument makers is that it's really an art. There is an art to making Absolutely. trumpets. Uh, it's not so much, you know, you go to a shop, you press a button, then it's done. There's really a lot of care that's taken. Um, and you see that you have a lot of uh, repeat customers, a lot of people that are really happy uh, with yeah. your with your trumpets, and that's that's great. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that you told me yesterday is uh, the number of trumpets that you make at Monet. Um, and I was thinking, okay, maybe a couple, couple thousand a, a month or something like that. But can you tell everyone how many trumpets do you make at Monet in a month? Yeah, we, we make four trumpets a month. Wow. So Other he, companies make a lot more than that. I, I'm not sure how many, but maybe as many as 200 a day. Wow. A day? Yeah. Wow. yeah and all of ours are custom built for each for, for a player, so we don't start building it until uh, someone puts down a deposit and they discuss with us uh, what their type of playing is, what types of rooms they play in. If they play in a small jazz club, we're gonna build a trumpet that's different from someone who plays in uh, Symphony Hall uh, or, or like Winton Marcellus, for example, who often is playing in large venues. We're gonna build the trumpet differently for those, for those people. So these are customized and they're tailored Absolutely. exactly to the the player. Um, and it, it shows yeah. that everyone, all the employees at Monet take a lot of care into into everything, um, and yes. especially each one of the trumpets that comes out. So that's really great. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions that I uh, want to make okay. sure that we have to ask. Uh, so the first one, Jeff, is what was the best musical experience you have uh, you've been a part of? Oh my gosh. Uh... I really have to sit down and think about that one. Um, boy, I've had so many great experiences because when I'm playing in the orchestra, the, the great thing about doing that is that I'm playing music by geniuses and I'm just sitting there and it's all around me. I love coming in uh, on Monday rehearsal and playing Beethoven and playing it all week and then performing it on the weekend. That's wonderful. Uh, I've uh, enjoyed, I got to sit next to Doc Severinsen uh, when he played with the Oregon Symphony, he came back and sat next to me. He played the lead trumpet book on a couple numbers, and I uh, had to bring an extra cut mute that, uh, for him to use so he didn't have to have an extra one. So that was a memorable uh, concert that I played, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to choose the, the best one ever. So the next question we have is from uh, Jeff Jackson. What compromises do you encounter with intonation or timbre in design of the uh, tubing configuration and valve design? Well, that's a tough question for me. I'm not really the designer of the trumpets. Uh, I just make the parts for them. Uh, but um, the the whole idea behind a Monet trumpet is uh, the, the constant pitch center, which the Mr. Monet d discovered on his own and no other uh, instrument in the world, to my knowledge, has uh, that. And so that's what we're doing. And we are, we change things by, you know, a, a ten thousandth of an inch to make, to make it play uh, better. And so uh, that's what we're doing here. Wow. Wow. And uh, next question is from uh, Dan Lee. Hi, Dan and Karen. Uh, instrument, the instrument Jeff was playing on in the trio looked like it may have some history. Be interesting uh, hearing about it. Okay. Um, well, 
I almost don't remember what instrument I was playing in that one because we have so many sitting around here. I often just pick one up and start playing it. I know that Charles Schluter had his decorated instrument and Dave Bamanti, he had the very first Rajah trumpet that was ever made, which was actually built for Charles Schluter back in about 1990. It was the first trumpet that Monette built that had a built-in mouthpiece. You can't remove it. Uh, and that uh, uh, led to all sorts of other designs uh, after he uh, made that instrument in 1990. Uh, my trumpet in that video, I'm not sure. I just probably picked it up and uh, walked out and played the excerpt with them. <laughs> all right, uh, next question. Uh, can you ask Jeff about Monette's new trumpet, the Infinity Trumpet? Wow, okay. Uh, yes, here it is in my hand. Uh, oh, wow. Look the, at yeah, look at that. So this is a trumpet, and you can see that the bends are all very, very wide. And what that does is it makes the sweet spots of all the notes bigger, and it makes it easier for the player to not miss, which is a big <laughs> thing. And uh, we call it the infinity trumpet because it goes around. Now, this is unusual. Trumpets are, don't usually do this. Uh, you have the lead pipe here, as we call it, and it's movable. This is how you tune the instrument right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but I'm pushing that in. And then you lock it down with this nut. And then the air goes through here and down here. And it wraps all the way around and goes into the, where is it? It goes into the first piston. But the bell comes out of the third piston. Wow. And it goes around. Let me get that there. And you can see my finger. And then comes out the end. So wow. uh, this is, in some ways, it's kind of backwards to what trumpets are. But that's why we call it the infinity trumpet right there. Um, it is actually also shorter from mouthpiece to bell. And we made that on purpose as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, two more questions. Uh, Clark and Eileen, hi, Clark and Eileen. They're asking, uh, what is the price range for a Monette trumpet? Yeah, well, uh, right now, uh, we have a model that starts at $8,900, and it goes up from there. Um, the model of trumpet that Wynton Marsalis would be playing uh, is around the $20,000 range. Uh, and uh, then our decorated trumpets, which uh, you will see, um, you know, I, who knows? They go way up, triple that. Mm -hmm. It just depends on uh, if they want jewels uh, embedded in them. If uh, all the artwork that is done, we have a, a local goldsmith here in Portland that does a lot of those designs with a saw and cuts them out it's called saw piercing. And uh, it's intricate work and it takes a long, long, long time. It usually takes us well over a year to make one of those trumpets. And uh, last question that we have is from Elon. He's asking, uh, he's saying <laughs> that Monet trumpets look so unique. Uh, could you talk about sheet bracing and Monet's choice to use it? Yeah, so uh, because of the constant pitch center that Mr. Monet figured out, we can actually make the trumpets heavier and heavier. And that helps uh, with the sound and it helps uh, uh, send the sound farther out into the hall. It also uh, helps lock in that pitch center so the the player uh, uh, doesn't have to manipulate the horn as much to, to play. But um, the reason why we use the sheet bracing, uh, I don't, here's an example of sheet bracing right here. This is what, this is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So normally there's a brace on the trumpet this just may be a bar like right here. If you can see that, see that bar, mm -hmm. uh, that is not very heavy, but, and so on a lightweight trumpet that you would buy uh, at your music store, it would need that weight of a brace, but Monet trumpets are much heavier. And so it makes sense that you would have heavier sheet bracing and that's all acoustic and the, there's a reason for it. It's not just aesthetic. And it makes a difference in the way uh, the instrument plays. Uh, so that's why we do that. Everything that we do is is on purpose and for uh, uh, musical purposes and, and not necessarily aesthetics. 
they do turn out, in my opinion, they look like beautiful works of art, but that is not the first primary intention. It's, it's really fascinating. And I had this uh, amazing experience. Uh, I was down in Brazil at a, a music festival where my husband was uh, was teaching at. And uh, there was a, a trombone maker there. And he said, come and try my trombones. And I said, no. And then he said, no, 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 come on and try them. <laughs> so I did. Um, but I, even though I, you know, I, I am a musician, have a degree in music, um, yeah. he, put, he put a trombone in front of me and then uh, he heard, listened to me play for a little bit. And then he just changed uh, the cap on the valve. And I don't know what he did, but it just completely changed the the color of the sound and it made the horn sound different. And so I said to him, I said, could that that small thing really make that much of a difference? And the answer is yes. So everything that you're doing um, at mm -hmm. Monet, it makes the horn sound different. Even I think uh, I think you were saying it's maybe one one thousandth of an of an inch or Absolutely. a millimeter or something. It, yes. it makes a, it makes a big difference. Well. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, no, I was just going to say, when you change one thing, you have to change something else. It's all related. Yeah. Uh, so if you uh, make a part that's a thousandth of an inch uh, shorter than the than it was, it's going to change and you're gonna have to do something else on another part of the trumpet. It's all about balance. Well, we have, uh, we have one more video to show you. Um, and before Jeff goes and uh, talks about this very, very amazing looking trumpet that we have, I just want to make sure uh, to thank uh, two very special donors uh, that we have, and that is uh, Dick Ammerman and Verity Lewis. Uh, Dick and Verity have been the sponsors of uh, Jeff's chair uh, with Symphony Tacoma for I am not even sure how long. Um, and they are wonderful members of our community. And not only that, but Dick has served served on the board of directors for Symphony Tacoma for 18 years. He served as president for uh, many years and just real assets that we have. Um, so I'd just like to thank Dick and Verity so much uh, for your for their chair sponsor. And if anyone who's watching wants to learn more about Symphony Tacoma and all of our programming, uh, please go to symphonytacoma.org. And just last plug before we get to talking about this video and then we'll show it and then I, I everyone can go out and have their dinner. Um, next week, we have our first uh, Interludes uh, series performance. This is our uh, brand new uh, chamber music series. And next week, uh, we are featuring um, a program called Dances and Goddesses, which features Jennifer Ryan on flute, Catherine Case on harp, and Denali Williams on percussion. And not only that, we didn't stop there. Maestra Sarah was very ambitious, and uh, we are featuring Tacoma City Ballet dancers with brand new choreography. So we hope you tune in to our uh, YouTube page next week. And of course, if you haven't done so, please, uh, like our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the free programming that we have here at Symphony Tacoma. So Jeff, uh, with all of that being said, yes. what is this last video that we have? Yeah, so this is uh, one of our presentation trumpets. And I did uh, bring it up a little bit earlier. It's for uh, a customer of ours named Don who owns the jazz club in Ann Arbor, Michigan called the Blue Llama. And uh, he bought this to be a centerpiece for his jazz club. And all of the icons that are on this instrument tell the story of his life. Uh, he sat down with Mr. Monette and Tammy, the uh, artist, the goldsmith, and they talked about all sorts of things from, from his life, his children, uh, you name it. And they came up with little icons that, uh, that tell the story of his life. And then Tammy went about uh, putting those in saw piercing, cutting them, uh, putting them in. The, the artwork is so intricate. I cannot believe that it, a human being did it. It's, it's incredible. Uh, you also notice on the bell that there's a secondary bell wrapped around it, which has, uh, it looks like lilies or flowers in there. And that was actually done uh, with um, chemicals. So we taped up that bell and, uh, and uh, made that part here. I actually have a picture of it. Uh, wow. so yeah. And, uh, so that, that bell that wraps around the bell is also a uh, part of the music of, of about the trumpet. It, it helps, uh, reflect sound around, not just out, but around and everywhere. And that's what we're going for with that design. All right. And Jeff, before uh, I think Susan's going to going to get that clip loaded, in your opinion, why are Monette's trumpets the best? <laughs> um, well, I do think they're the best, and uh, that's the reason I've been working here for uh, 28 years, and I'm probably going to work here until I retire. Um, everyone that works here 
has the same vision that Mr. Monette has, and that is to build the best trumpet that we can with no limits. And so uh, uh, the constant pitch center that he discovered uh, almost 40 years ago, uh, that has led us to make trumpets that were lighter weight and more conventional looking. And, but now we can experiment and make trumpets that are completely different, bigger, heavier, you name it, uh, decorated. And that vision is something we all share here. And that's why we drive into work every day and we love doing it. And everything keeps changing. We're not building the same instrument at all that was being built in 1983 when the company was founded. It changes every day. And uh, I love that. That's great. And so, Jeff, um, you said that you're playing a recital tomorrow. Uh, any information yeah. if people want to watch that, where, where to go? Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's at four o'clock Pacific time. Uh, it's on the St. Paul's Episcopal Church of Salem, Oregon, their YouTube page. So I think what you can do is go to stpaulsoregon.org. That's S-T-P-A-U-L-S Oregon.org. And then you can look, it's the Even Song Concert. It's at four o'clock, like I said, and you can click on that. It'll take you to their YouTube page and you can watch it live. I believe it'll be available uh, afterwards, but... Um, uh, we'll see if, uh, yeah, there it is. I, uh, we'll see how I do. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get that, uh, last clip, uh, loaded. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you. I know it's a, it's a Saturday night. It's uh, late. I know that you're in the, that factory. I just want to say thank you so much for, for everything. And we really appreciate yeah. it. And we can't wait to listen to your recital tomorrow. And most okay. we can't wait to listen to, to you playing just in a couple months. Uh, Jeff will be yeah. on our, uh, holiday brass concert, uh, which will be coming up to you in December. And before we know it, yeah. we'll be in December and maybe we'll be in Jumanji level 10 at that point. That's right. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I'll go thank home you. and practice Christmas carols right now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay.